welcome. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, no, great to be here. Hey, thanks for uh, thanks for taking the time because you're a busy man. So let me introduce you to the uh, to to what this is basically. <laughs> so this is a weekly call we do with the community. I'm going to start. Um, I'm going to start recording it too. Uh, so I'm going to start the recording now. All right, so welcome everybody. This is a power. Change the name from synchronicity to power just now on the community Discord as well. So this is a power weekly call that happens every Tuesday at 6 p.m. CT, so Paris time. And uh, we uh, we generally do it either private or public. This one is public. It's recorded and it's also on uh, on YouTube live. <laughs> I see it now. I played uh, with it. I, I was interested in sharing this link. It's on on my Twitter account. This is just playing for now. Um, so we have today a topic which is web free. And the reason why we picked Web3 is because Wawa is about ancient and new technologies. So today we're going to focus on new technologies. And I could not have a better host than, uh, than Yatsu that I think, I think we know each other yet for about uh, 25 years or something like this. Yeah, something insane. <laughs> something insane, like when you can't count anymore. But I, I want to say before introducing you yet that uh, Yat is... Um, um, a dear friend, obviously, for so many years, but he's also someone that has always supported me and my businesses, and is also supporting Power. And uh, so, thank you yet for that. But this is not because you support me that you're here. I would have loved to have you, whether you support it or not, because you are one of the top players in crypto and also in uh, the web free space. And the reason why we have this call uh, today is that um, there, there is a lot of questions and conversations about Web3 uh, from members of the community and also from me. And I, I, I will say, as you tweeted, by the way, that was very funny. Join me with my old friend, uh, uh, Loic, who is um, an old web guy or something. <laughs> <laughs> and and so I'm learning Web3. So please help us all learn. And so, yeah, why don't you introduce yourself? Because I, I see a lot of things about Animal Cab Brands. It's a huge, you have, I think, 300 plus companies you either started or you even invested in, like OpenSea, the leader of uh, the NFTs. And, uh, and, and you have, yeah, I mean, it's a huge, can you just tell us a few words about maybe about you sure. and Animal Cab? No, thank, thank you. you. So, um, yeah, first of all, when I tweeted that, I wasn't trying to say that you're old, it was just that we that you've been in the web for a long time. And I think this is part of that journey. And we can discuss it uh, afterwards a little bit. But um, so quickly, I mean, just a little bit on my background. Uh, so, you know, I, I grew up a little differently, uh, although ethnically I'm Chinese. I was born and raised in Austria. Uh, German is my mother tongue. And I think the way that I view the world and how we think of the metaverse and how we build Animoga brands is a little bit of a reflection of the way that I grew up um, in Europe because um, my mother was a classical musician. I grew up studying music. So I saw a little bit of that world. And I grew up in the 70s and 80s uh, in Vienna. So that was right, you know, you know, when the Cold War still was around. And my mother used to work at the um, at the Komische Oper in Berlin, Berlin, which is basically I guess what was in it used to be Eastern Germany. So to see her, you know, after school, eventually during breaks, um, because we were actually in different places, I would cross the border and I would witness basically what um, what real communism looked like. Um, and so that was one extreme. So I went from a, living in a socially democratic, democratic place, place to experiencing communism. And then eventually through work, I won't explain the whole background, how I got to that. I ended up in the US, which is, you know, hyper-capitalism, right? And experienced the world of money in a different way. And then I moved to Hong Kong, which is even more capitalist <laughs> and even more about money and, and, and all the issues around that and the benefits of this. So I kind of saw the lens around this. And, and so, so for Animoca Brands, what we built, just to fast forward a little bit, is a business that is about delivering true digital property rights. And people look at us as a gaming company because we focused on gaming, but we only focused on gaming because, well, initially, because we felt that 
gamers today already have a relationship with their virtual goods as one of ownership. A meaning whether you play a game or you have children that play games, you know, they think that the assets that they have inside the game, whether it's a skin or a sword or a car, should be one that they own. They, you know, when they talk to their friends, they don't say, oh, that's a nice virtual car. That's a nice racing car you just rented, right? Which is actually what's happening. They think you should own it. So they already have that construct in there. Um, and it's a little bit where the world has also changed and moved because there's 3.4 billion people who play games today, which is most of the internet. There's about four and a half or 4.6 billion people online, you know, 3.4 billion people play games. Um, and so generationally speaking, there is already um, a metaverse that has formed as well. And the thinking around um, digital property rights comes around the ownership of data, which we consider as the most valuable resource on earth today, right? And so when we think about history in humanity, it's all about the fight of natural resources and the control over it. And, you know, wars are fought, you know, countries are born from this and all that kind of stuff. The same is emerging here, except these countries today look different. You know, we think of, you know, Facebook as an empire. We think of Apple as, you know, a sort of a, a major sort of, you know, like say feudal, feudal kingdom. Because every time that when we use these platforms, every time we use Facebook, we don't think of us creating, getting a benefit of their service. We think that we're working for them because we give our data to them right? and they monetize the data. And because we don't know the value of that data, um, we're basically surrendering all of our digital sovereignty, all of our digital rights. Inversely, if we stopped using Facebook, what's the value of Facebook? Nothing, actually, right? If we stopped using Twitter, there's no value in Twitter whatsoever. So we are the contributors of the value because we, we generate network effects for it. And the power of data is that it has the ability to generate limitless network effects because actually that is what you know, human knowledge can do as well. Right? Like, you know, a physical resource like oil has an ability to create certain network effects, but it only becomes interesting because of human ingenuity, right? It only becomes interesting because of, of, of what we do to it, not because inherently, uh, you know, oil has a natural quality in and of itself. Um, and, and so this formation of these ideas now is no longer owned by us. So we're digital dependents. If Facebook or Twitter as Luik also painfully experienced, and we with the App Store ourselves, removes you from the platform, you don't only lose your business, you also lose your digital identity. Your, um, you know, your Instagram handle that you may have, you know, sort of built up to 10 million followers, you don't actually own that, right? It can be removed at any time. So which means that, again, you are subservient to a digital platform that uh, sort of controls all this. And, like Luik, in the early days of the internet, we were big, you know, big believers in open source. You know, the internet was sort of this sort of really sort of open system of information. You create more sort of equity of a different kind, knowledge equity. Uh, and, you know, in Web2, that became centralized because we couldn't make sense of the data. We also gave it away because we didn't know that data was valuable to us because data to us isn't that valuable. Um, and so with Web3 and why blockchain is so interesting, and what attracted us to why we built Animoca Brands in this way is that for the first time, data, which is also private good, you know, retained in the database of, say, Facebook, um, with their permission, because it's in their system, now is a public good, which means all of the things that we can now transact and verify and audit becomes public, not just accountable, but also something that, um, that we can now construct open uh, network effects on it. Um, and non-fungible tokens to us represent it as the best way to do that because we can now blend in our personal human identity through digital assets because we think of anything we purchase or anything we do as part of our social identity. Like, you know, the clothes you wear, you know, they don't have to be expensive, right? But, but you know, or the, the place you live in, right? These, these are all social identifiers um, of who you are. You, you, you want to wear this shirt or you want to be seen with this car or you want to do whatever, these all say something about you. So assets are social identifiers, they identify who you are. Um, and in the digital world, we do this already. Our kids you know, love their skins. It says something about them, except they can't own it. Um, and then with that, you can have then these capital formation. And with the capital formation, the value to redistributes around you know, just how physical property rights have redistributed power from feudal societies into democratic capitalist ones. 
And with this decentralization of power, you have a new balance of equity. And, and the final thing I'll, I'll say about this is that, you know, because we are the generators of this data, we are unlike, you know, when you physically own land, you, you know, you own the land, therefore you get the benefits of this land, this, but, you know, but that might be scarce. The resource of the metaverse is data, and we are the generators of the data, which means that we are sort of the wellspring of ideas, and we can always generate our own form. So we think that you know, instead of the future of, of being a kind of universal basic income, it would be a, more of a universal basic equity, where we don't necessarily make the same amount of money, but we are contributors to the network, and therefore always generate some value, um, you know, going forward. So, you know, outside of building our own businesses like Sandbox and so on, we have over 20 group companies. Uh, we employ about 900 people today within the group, but we've made outside of that an additional 380 investments today uh, in Animoca Brands is because we take a different approach to investing. We're not a VC, so we don't have a fund. So so, so some the criticism would be, well, isn't that like scattershot investing? Aren't you just like throwing money around and sort of, you know, spray and pray type of thing? And, and, and our, our view on this one, we're not investing in companies just because we hope they all make a return. Because that would be the VC approach, right? I want to invest in this company and have like a, you know, 10x, 20x or 30x. And so I need to diligently look for the winner. Instead, we're trying to find companies that construct the network effects of digital property rights as in NFTs to build the Web3 space. So an example would be gaming guilds. We've made a lot of investments in gaming guilds that promote gaming. It's probably not a good idea to invest in, you know, the 15 gaming guilds that we did, because arguably they compete with each other, and arguably not, you know, not all of them will be super successful. But they, what they do do is they onboard lots of users into Web3. They give value to the, you know, in their particular economies. Um, they may never be, you know, the 10x success per se. Maybe some will, um, but they grow the whole ecosystem as a whole, which means the rest of our portfolio and our main businesses grow and thrive as a result of that. Right, so we don't look at investments solely from the purposes of each company must have a financial return, but rather what does each company do to grow the network effect for the shared network effect that we think Web3 will have, which is why we continue to invest aggressively. So sorry, that was a long preamble. But no, yeah. no, 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 no. Yet, can we come back? So just so you know here, um, power and synchronicity are, are also a community about consciousness and... Uh, you know, even spirituality some, some, somehow, which we, we are, we're not sure what exactly this means. But I'm just saying that some of us here might not, uh, including me with a few things you said, might not be totally knowledgeable. So expect any type of question. But I'll ask you one. Can you define what is a web-free business? Because uh, I am building a business right now. Yeah. And so I, the I way bold, like I want everything to be web free. So what is it? Like if we start a business today, what is a web, a web free? To business? build web three to us is to build on chain. And to build on chain means you have to build on a public blockchain from our perspective. Right. And what it means is that everything you build is, you know, um, becomes like an open layer, open abstraction that you can then compose freely on top of. Because whatever you build on Web3, that ownership can be transferred to someone else, and then they can build their own network effects and own that. So this is essentially, um, you know, the one expression that people have given is, you know, if, if Web1 is read and Web2 is read-write, then Web3 is, is, is read-write and own. Right? But so now, I'm going to play the devil's advocate all of yeah. a stupid guy. Or I am sometimes when it doesn't matter. But I, I, as you said, we were all dreaming in 93, 95 about an internet open, right? With uh, Tim Berners-Lee and Wikipedia. And, and the joke is all we got is Facebook and Google, um, <laughs> right? And so here, you're, what you're saying is basically put everything public on the blockchain. So... Like, for example, we started, so we sell tickets to Power Paris. Please all join October 14th and 15th. And we picked a uh, web free company called Guts, uh, which sells tickets and it's all on the blockchain. So that means that anyone can verify who bought a ticket <clears throat> to Power, if I understand well. It, and really, Correct. the reason why we checked it is that we took this rather than taking, you know, um, traditional options is that we we wanted to be able to make it 
you know, also a little special. So when you get a ticket the day of a conference, it will turn into an NFT, which will go on uh, open sea. If you go to all the Pawa events, maybe you have a collection of NFTs. We can build something on it. I always had this idea that I wanted to do NFTs with, uh, you know, the feathers of the indigenous, and I, I have like some in my behind me, and and I, who knows, you know. So what what does it mean? That means that. Another business, now I'm going back to a bigger question. Like if I share so much, like another business can come and take all the source code and also steal it or build on top of it. So they so they can't steal the source code per se, maybe if it's depending on what you've built on it, right? But they can get access to your customers by offering them a service to say, everyone who bought a ticket to Power, I can offer you a service too because you were a Power customer. Now, the classic Web2 model of thinking is, oh, that's stealing my customer. That's bad because obviously, you know, I, the customer I spent so much money acquiring will now move to a potential competitor. He's going to run a, you know, Power2 or whatever. A web and, Summit. And, yeah, exactly. A web Summit, right? And, you, and, and, and you know, Web Summit goes, every Power customer will give you 20% off. Come come, come to me, right? So that's that seems to be the threat. But of course- They did that anyway. Way, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but the alternative on this is to say, well, actually, now the power membership is valuable because I have power membership. Other people want me, right? So in other words, because I am now this community of people that are very focused on consciousness and maybe ancient technologies combined with newer technologies is a very specific group. And so the membership of power starts to become of value. And so when, and maybe this membership might, in the case of a PFP example, might only have 10,000 memberships. It doesn't have to be limited like this, but it's an example then in order for me to be part of this member, I will need to buy it from someone else. And every time the transaction happens to become that member, the original organization yourself receives a cut in the transaction fee. And so you end up making a different kind of sustainable revenue based on the network effects that the membership of power provides rather than selling more power tickets every single time, right? And so through the membership of this NFT, you could form 50 different power-like organizations. Like within this community, someone can say, you know what, I'm gonna form a power chapter in, I don't know, New York or something, right? Well, how do I know if you're a power member? In fact, I don't, uh, you know, and unless I go and talk to you and say, oh, Louis, can you verify if this person actually attended power? No, by just having the NFT, I know that I have at least shown my membership to this one and then I can form a local chapter and therefore create an added network effect on, on top of the original membership that you grew. So, so this is the benefit, right? And it's great for small companies because you don't have the ability to build network effects like this otherwise. Now, if you're a large company, you can, you know, the, um, they may seem like a threat if you are an almost monopoly, but the other way to think of it is actually it's an anti-monopolistic feature of Web3. So take for instance, what OpenSea had with LooksRare. Op OpenSea, you know, all of its, anyone who traded on OpenSea, what looks where it did was, they did what's known as a vampiric attack. They said, everyone who, who uh, um, traded an NFT in the last six months on OpenSea, you can come to LooksRare and we'll give you free tokens, like an introductory token for you to trade on LooksRare. So obviously what happened is every OpenSea customer is like, well, you know, I'm gonna go try LooksRare. And so they acquired all these customers. Uh, and even though it didn't become a, a major competitor to OpenSea, it created a sort of a service uh, a new add-on there. Now, the response for OpenSea in a Web2 model is to close it off, which is what Facebook and Twitter does with APIs. We shut you off and you can't do this anymore, right? But in the Web3 model, you can't do that because the ownership of that data, the sovereignty is yours. So you as a customer get to decide whether OpenSea or LooksRare is better. That means OpenSea's job is not to make the mode harder for you to leave. OpenSea's job is to make it better for you as a customer to stay with it. So this is the philosophical difference between the competition, where true competition evolves because someone else can say, hey, I, you know, like imagine if Facebook's data was truly open and its APIs could never be closed. Well, <laughs> well, well what will happen is, is that, you know, Facebook has to evolve itself in many ways to ensure that it can keep its customers by making sure it provides not only the best service, but maybe the most ethical service or the most moral service. I don't know, whatever that may be. And today we do this in the real world. We choose to do things like we might pay more money for organic food, or we might pay more money for sustainable technologies, 
because we have a you know a fear sense of duty or a sense of community and we don't mind doing that we consciously choose to do that as a consumer as opposed to um being forced to buy something right and in a digital world we couldn't do this before but now with non-fungible tokens you can mm -hmm. right so so the, the, the freedom of this is is what's important because now the layer of data is completely auditable across across all networks just one question and then i think we can start opening to everybody here of course i'm really curious to to hear about thierry and and, and daniel as well <laughs> but uh uh just one more one more question and I, I don't want to talk about the power business but in general i would like to do that as well but if you can answer in general i have obviously like many here looked at tokens and bought some tokens lost money made money mostly lost money to be honest but let's not get in there or maybe someone asked that question i won't but i i see it as 2001 everything crashed great now we can do the real business um here's a question all, all the good tokens seem to have DAOs, so a place where the community can go and vote on projects subject projects um su submit sorry projects and say what they want sometimes honestly it kind of feels fake that they they see the votes but they they do something else or you know i, I don't really know but i liked that a lot as an approach of saying okay like for example for an event it would be who you want as a speaker right and everybody votes i would, I would like to do that right now actually maybe you can help me set up a down in, in a second but so that's the first thing and then there is the the, the token itself Right. I, I have also, I honestly, I'm kind of dreaming about this, like having, we have uh, about 40 people who want to volunteer for the event and help and or more, I don't know. And and like they can do, we could help on the content, they could help on welcoming people, I don't know. But if we had a power token, then we could start saying, okay, here are some tokens for that. And so I would like to do this too. How difficult is it for an entrepreneur? Let's forget power for a second but if you want to do those two things like a voting place right where the community can can be a shareholder somehow that's how i understand the tokens and i love that it's like a, instead of going public you, you just issue tokens and two like this voting mechanism where it becomes kind of a is it a democracy can you talk a little over sure. the two things thank so, you so so the first thing is the tools are there so for instance um you know there's platforms like snapshot which already has a voting mechanism, token-gated systems, right? Um, where you're basically able to do all of this type of stuff if you want. And, and that's what we use for ApeCoin, which is a you know, probably a pretty big DAO at this point, uh, which is the you know, started off with the Board Apes community, but now is, is fairly large. Um, and people vote on actions like literally every week. We have like five or six things that you know we vote on. And um, and then as um on the council, we you know obviously approve what gets uh, decided on. What can get voted on if it makes sense, but we don't, you know, we don't decide. We just execute the wishes of the community. So it is, in some form, maybe um, very much a, uh, a a sort of a direct democracy in, in that sense, which may be good or bad things. And and by the way, some DAOs are structured in a delegated system, so it's more representative. And and, and I'll you know before I sort of specifically talk about some of the execution things, one way to think about blockchain, you know, uh, cryptocurrencies aside, is that actually um, we don't think of blockchain purely as a technology, because from a database standpoint, you know, it's inefficient, it's got a few things that, you know, it's not faster than MySQL, right, you know, what's the whole point, but actually the transparent framework around this, really what blockchain is, is a political and social system embedded with technology, because it means that anytime you make any decision, like with Ethereum as a foundation, if you want, you know, to move from, you know, basically the new ETH staking protocol and, and the merge, People had to vote on it, right? And every person who owns Ethereum got to decide whether ETH should stay proof of work or move to proof of stake, for instance. It's can a massive you pause here on, yet, can you pause here on this one for a second? Steve Jobs has not invented the iPhone by listening to customers, right? Right. So he, mm -hmm. we had Nokia and Ericsson, and they were not very good compared right. to an iPhone now, right? Then copied by Android. But here's the thing is that that's always like, I love this interaction with the community. The community here knows, I love it. I, I listen as much as possible. And sometimes I just do something. <laughs> so yes. how do you, like, basically it's a question about the wisdom of the crowds, right? It's like, 
so I don't think, I I don't think Steve Jobs read the internet or talked to focus groups or got votes to do the iPhone or not. He woke up no, one day. But he, did, like, he obviously did get inspiration from others. Ideas aren't made in a vacuum. But but, before, but that aside, right? Um, so I think there's a few 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 things to think about. The first one is just because there is a consensus mechanism for a decision for the entire protocol to go to does not mean that an individual cannot do what he or she would like to do individually. For instance, I can build anything I want on Ethereum. I don't need the Ethereum community to agree on this. I can just use the token and build a protocol of my own or build an application, a dApp or a game and just launch it. But I, am, I have the benefit of at least launching it on the Ethereum platform to the entire community and you basically, uh, um, um, you know, maybe promote it to them and they can use their tokens if they want it as currency. But it, most importantly, what Ethereum, the blockchain does is it provides the trust layer of transaction. But right? the value of using Ethereum is I can now trust what's in there. Because if I send you this token or if I send you this NFT, I know it's really sent to you, right? So it, it takes care of that. And the real innovation, by the way, on blockchain for the financial industry, for instance, is that you now have a financial infrastructure that would normally cost hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars for any bank to build, but now is public infrastructure, which is the reason why, you know, some kid can run a DeFi protocol that can run a yield program that is effectively like a lending facility that normally only Goldman Sachs could build. But, you know, it's, it's not that different from, you know, how code amateurized services as well, right? What blockchain did is it amateurized this type of trust technology um, at a scale, because now you can trust that, right? Uh, because because it's got the redundant mechanisms. You know, if you remember, to build a really strong database with all the redundant mechanisms, we had to hire the best engineer, the best database guy. You know, like it was almost impossible to get this person. Never mind the infrastructure to build like your own mini Amazon, right? And that now is public infrastructure for anyone to compose on. So that's one, right? So you're always free to do your own thing. But then the other part is that if you want to be able to uh, elect, you know, the crowds to come with you. You have a way of reaching all of them, right? It's as if you could always contact Facebook users somehow, because every wallet address is known, right? You can you can go after them and say we offer something cool or come vote or something as a as a mass proposal. Um, and then the, the the third point I would say is that to us the DAO is exciting because it's essentially a digital democracy, but it can now innovate democratic systems at the pace of technology. So if you innovate on a democracy in the real world, it's kind of dangerous. Right? You can screw it up. And if you if you mess it up, then it can have very disastrous effects because you don't have sort of you can't you can't MVP a democratic system uh, with real people involved in it. But in a DAO, you can do that, right? Which means there'll be many DAOs that fail, but those that come with superior systems will become the model in which actual democracies can learn from. Because I now have a simulated model. I can see whether this you know, governance system is working. I mean, we're still building off democratic frameworks based on the American constitution. I mean, it's great. It's clearly redundant and not, I mean, resilient, but it is after all, you know, three, 400 years old, right? You know, so it is subject to some innovations which you can't really do because it's risky um, if, if, you, if you do it otherwise. So, so you can experiment in the metaverse as we have with technology broadly, right? Like if you think about the things we build in technology and then you know we bring it to real life as well for for those effects. So, uh, and uh, the last point I'll say about this is that uh, I think sometimes people forget. I think that you know the, the value of a democratic system is that it's meant to bring it's meant to lift everyone up, right? So instead of saying, well, you know, I only want to elect the top leaders in and of itself to run the country, actually the leader's job is to bring everyone to a higher level so that whatever he's trying to do is understandable to you so that you'll agree to it, right? As opposed to just give me a blanket vote to do whatever I want, right? Um, which is a more elitist approach, right? The strong leaders are actually the ones who, who don't just empathize with, the, with, with, their, with, with their community, but also basically bring them to a level where they appreciate why your approach is better. And, and for that reason, you know, if you look at, for instance, I think back in, 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 in ancient Greece, Actually, they invented democracy, right? But Socrates was really much against it because he was worried about the tyranny of the masses. In fact, he struggled from this because the masses didn't understand because they were probably ignorant, and eventually he got executed. But right. but 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 uh, but today that doesn't happen because we have 
different ideas about human rights. We have different values. We we don't throw um, Christians to the lions, you know. Like we we have we have a we have a we have a, a, a framework where a democratic system now makes a bit more sense. And eventually, you know, ten years, twenty years, hundred years will evolve even further. And so my 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 broad sense is that. Uh, DAOs advance it faster because it forces, like for instance, every time we do a proposal on ApeCoin, um, it forces the press, the proposer to educate the entire community why it's a good thing, right? Which is basically just another form of education. Yet I will open to Thierry, but before I say that, I, 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 I um, or before Thierry comments or asks a question, and then Daniel, um, it's kind of sad though that the only country that really tried to move on with crypto is ecuador right and ended up buying a shitload of crypto at 65 dollars and now it's 20. Uh, it's like I, I would love to see a country experiment with DAOs instead but it's this is so sad right now like the, the guy was well, like just so friend. you know um in the us wyoming is probably the only state in the us and perhaps even in the world that has legalized DAOs. Which is interesting. So if mm. you do, uh, if you, if you, so they actually recognize DAOs as legal structures. So it's happening. And in the UK, they're starting to debate digital property rights as an actual property. So, so it's beginning, right? Because you know, before Bitcoin or before crypto as a form of digital ownership, that wasn't even a possible construct, right? Uh, digital rights is like air. It's like how can I legalize this? So therefore, it's based on contract, right? But you know, if we start moving to a world where these things actually have a real property right, then it's a completely different kind of protection, right? All right. I uh, will uh, open the floor. Thierry, you want to comment yes. on question for Yad? Yes, thank you, Loic. And thank you, Yad, for uh, for all these words. Very interesting. Um, I So I'm, uh, we are currently building a, a music platform and uh, we're implementing a, a few Web3 services. One of them is, uh, you know, uh, registering your work, your music, uh, the original work. So before you had a tape or you had a, a you know, a physical band. And so now really to record your digital, really original work. That's something we do, for example. And when you were talking, I was wondering, because all of this, when my question is, when do you see it becoming mainstream? Because you were talking about, you know, owning your digital assets but it's still today it's still esoteric you still need to code or you still need to have a wallet which is today not very easy to have a wallet um, so when do you see blockchain becoming mainstream in the sense that anyone from my grandmother to my to my children being able to access you know data on on a blockchain so for example you know today my my grandmother when she's streaming music she doesn't know she's streaming music but she's playing a button on the net and she's listening to music but she doesn't know the technology behind it's streaming so because what you said is very important about democracy owning your data uh, that question of ownership but how do you see it becoming you know mainstream that anyone could have access to it so I, um, first of all, I agree with you, um, but I used to be very much in the camp of we need to make it as accessible and as easy as possible. And while that's still to an extent true, there is a lesson here that if you make it too easy, too accessible, then you begin to lose why it works and why it's valuable because you take it for granted. So I think of this as, you know, like I, I live in Asia, and we have a different kind of appreciation to a democratic system than I would argue Americans have today. Because I think Americans take democ democracy maybe for granted because it's been there for so long. And you know, if people valued the democratic institution the way that they would or should perhaps, you wouldn't have barely 50% you know, participation rates, right? You, you should have 80 or 90% participation rights if you thought this was truly valuable to you. Right? And whereas with younger democracies, you have very high participation rates because it's meaningful, because they fought for it or they thought it was critical. So I think there's an element, there's a balance there, which is we need to make things convenient so it's not a hassle, but we can't lose the lesson of why it's important. So decentralization is the same. The more convenient you are, the less decentralized you become because you need to give ownership of your assets to custodian. 
it's a little bit like do you are you you know the owner of your identity or do you give the ownership to someone else to manage it for you for your convenience right uh, and and so 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 while it's obviously you know it's somewhat philosophical but it's meaningful as well like for instance really strong crypto pundits don't even want to put their tokens in an exchange they're like i'm holding it in my cold wallet and it's there because they're really strong believers in property rights right um, and you know, and, and by the way, I, I'm, I'm not at all someone who's pro-gun or something, but it's a little bit the same idea of what people who are pro-gun, for instance, who are like, well, I, I need to have the right of this, right? It's, you know, who, wh why do we need to outsource safety to ourselves, right? That seems ridiculous from a European perspective, but maybe to an American, for some Americans, this is absolutely sacrosanct. This is very religious to them almost because it's their duty and their sense of, um, a a a, um, a sort of a responsibility almost for a certain group of people that you have the right to 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 do that right and so I think decentralization follows a similar ethos as well that you don't need everyone to do this but you need enough people to do it so that you can keep it decentralized because the issue with web one to web two is that we gave it away to the platforms because of convenience partially also because convenience didn't the the value wasn't there for us we didn't understand its value so we gave it away because compared to convenience and the value convenience won over but in web3 you have value if you for instance in the extreme case have a board ape you're not going to give it to someone else right because it's now worth a lot so that value in itself is sufficient for you to wish to defend it and to ensure that it's protected and that it can't be stolen from you or taken from you Right. And so this is this is part of that sort of uh, sort of a push and pull. Now, one of our earliest um, uh, biggest investments in in, in game game uh, GameFi is Axie Infinity, and Axie Infinity really grew in the Philippines. And what was fascinating about Axie was that it grew, you know, it grew because of COVID, but it grew in the Philippines in a community that didn't have university education for the most part, couldn't even get a credit card because they were unbanked, and yet they knew how to open a crypto wallet, and they were basically playing a blockchain game. That perhaps many people in the West would say, oh, this is so complicated. But actually opening up a MetaMask wallet and getting comfortable with crypto is easier than opening a bank account at your local Chase or Citibank, right? You don't have to show your ID. You don't have to do the same thing. Actually, it's easier. It's just unfamiliar, right? So that's yeah. one, one, one aspect to think of it. That doesn't mean we can't do things better or that we can be more efficient. But the ethos of decentralization, I think, is, is really important because it's Self custody, self sort of your own sovereignty, managing your managing your, your your own identity. I think is a is a critical component. So it's education, and if you look at social norms today, there's a lot of social norms we do today that might be considered awkward for someone, you know, 500 years in the past, like you know things that we do that now are normal to us because they have become patterns. Uh, you know, like, I don't know, the way we dress, social behavior, shaking hands, serving people, I don't know, right? <laughs> so, so social norms that we've come to accept. Um, um, and by the way, this always happens as well when people from the US want to do business in China, they struggle because they just don't understand the social norms, right? There's some things that are complicated and only someone who has grown up in China or has grown up in a culture like that or Japan understands, you know, how to deal with this and again, it's it's complicated, but it's innate to them, and, and I don't think we can we can make that easier. So I think education is the more important part than just making it super convenient. Of course, there's a there's a dynamic, but broadly speaking, that's kind of how we think about it. Thank you, yet uh, Daniel, and then I would love to have uh, for balance, uh, if possible, a woman ask a question. So if you can just raise a hand, uh, just for balance, yeah, Daniel. You're, you're muted. You're muted. Yeah. So I, so I didn't know if I really had a question. Um, did I raise my hand? Um, you always have uh, a question, Daniel, or pushback, like something, like something controversial, <laughs> or like like uh, crypto is going to destroy the world. I, I'm just expecting something really pushing back yet on on something, just for for entertainment, please. Uh, okay, got it. Well, yeah, but I really, really enjoyed uh, his talk, uh, and I went and read as, we, as he was talking the uh, piece which I posted on ownership and capitalism. Um, so yeah, I would have to ruminate on it a little bit, but I mean, um, one issue for me, and I, you brought up, I thought it was very interesting, digital identity, 
uh, in the beginning. Um, and I'm wondering how Web3 can help solve that. So at the moment, I mean, that was, I, I had a company many years ago called Evolver, and we were trying to, um, you know, we were hoping to sort of deal with the, with the web identity project. But I mean, apparently, when you know when the internet started, it was scientists, and um, they were excited about it for research. So they never really thought about the concept of digital identity, uh, which then ultimately became the reason why the Web three has kind of like backfired so intensively, right? Because um, everybody kind of owns your identity, you know, fragmented across uh, all these platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, you know? Do you see a, a solution to that in, in the open metaverse, like a way that people can have yes. like a sacrosanct holder uh, of their own identity? So, I mean, Vitalik proposed something called Soulbound, um, which are basically um, sort of NFTs that can't leave your wallet as a way to create your identity. I have conflicting thoughts about it, but it's a way, it's one method, right? Because the wallet address is your identity. And with that identity, you can then basically know that, oh, this is Loic's wallet, and I always know what's in there, that he is who he is, right? Uh, kind of thing. And the transactions he does, or the things he, 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 he performs on his wallet, which is publicly available, give an indication as to you know, who he is. That, by the way, that identity could be anonymous, right? Like people who collect certain NFTs or do stuff, but I can still see through the transaction whether he's a good actor or a bad actor, you know, who he transacts with, what he does is a way to create credibility, right? And that's the whole sort of benefit for, in some ways, the, the zero knowledge aspect where I can anonymously transact with someone, but yet still have the benefit of a person's history based on his wallet, right? Now, there is an argument to be made that we should have multiple identities. And I think in the real world, we do that anyway, meaning that I am, you know, a certain person with my family, and we're all the same people, but in our identities, we're not necessarily mix them, right? At work, I'm a certain person. With my friends, I'm a certain person. Maybe with my high school mates, I'm a certain person. And with my family, I'm a different person. With my mom, I'm definitely a different person, right? So, so, so we all have um, slightly different ways in which we sometimes have our personas, um, and we, um, which, which we prefer. And we see this in the gaming world, right? Where someone who plays Fortnite isn't the same identity or persona when he's playing Apex Legends or when he's on Dota or when he's on Roblox or on Minecraft, right? Uh, they don't necessarily play the same the, 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 with the same friends. So I think um, there's there's some argument to be made that different personas and personalities in some ways is a form of our identity formation. But speaking of sort of, you know, um, digital identity, you can form these identities and create them because you have, you know, an asset ownership that is verified. Like you own this board ape, okay, that's who you are. And that's your identity. And I recognize that. And nobody else can take that away from you, right? Um, because it's actually yours. Uh, and if someone was to forge it, well, you know what? The actual original with the original hash ID is only one. So nobody can actually take that away. That's the other thing, right? On Instagram, people forge photos, forge identities. You know, <laughs> you know, a number of us, including myself, often have fake Instagram accounts because you just take my photo and put it on Instagram and you know, take my name and just give me a dash or something. And then, you know, you, if you're not careful, you might get scammed. That type of stuff you can't do on Web3 because you have a unique identifier. Um, and eventually this type of stuff on the application level will be easily discovered, right? Which is also, you know, the, the perfect solution for things like um, sort of, you know, um, sort of royalties and just property, right? Like that's why when I trade a piece of art, I know that this is authentic art and therefore I'm willing to pay a royalty versus this is a forgery and therefore I don't I don't want that. So so I think that's definitely um, you know a plus point um, around that because of the on-chain um, verification. Amazing. Thanks so much. It was fascinating. Uh, yeah, I'd love to like to be in touch with you further. Are you going to put like your email in the chat or uh, yeah sure of course. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he's uh, very generous with his time with us. Um, Natalia, Nicola, I'm gonna skip Keep you for now, just for now, because uh, we need some balance. <laughs> so, Natalia, if you can, are you here? All right. So, yeah, thank you. We're listening to you. I made the internet happen. I'm completely offline these days, and uh, this meeting was like, I need to make everything possible to make it happen. Really glad to be here. Uh, to me, blockchain technology and Web3 is spiritual technology very spiritual technology if we really make it the way that is in a balanced and very aware way we can really create a new type of humanity in a way that is really creating a new uh, governmental layer 
that helps us and allows us to create a global society of individuals that are stronger together to create something that is beyond uh, digital identity. It's the identity of the global citizen, of the human, of the planet Earth. And really stop, start dropping bits and pieces of wisdom, such as plant medicine and uh, the wisdom of the moon and the wisdom of the planets and the wisdom of balance, truth, um, pause. And uh, the question for you guys, I'm, I'm really curious to see um, like this, this word decentralization, okay? It's pretty hyped up. Nobody really knows what it means. Um, to me, decentralization is ability to outsource uh, the skills that I don't have to someone else uh, in a way that is trustless, in a way that is unconditional and allow the flow of the universe uh, to flow uh, through the reflection of someone else. Yet I'm currently working on something like that I call Web3 um, Media Alliance and um, redefining what media is. I'm coming from Russia and it's really uh, edgy to call yourself a media, <laughs> you know. Um, so the Media Alliance is uh, decentralizing media completely and uh, seeing every single individual as a source of information. I think we all started to do that deeper in 2020. And my question is to the speakers and those that are aware about the Web3 world is what do you guys follow to stay on track uh, for the topic of the Web3? Because right now, I, uh, I mean, I've, I've gone through stages and stages of keeping up, but my mental health has been, you know, in this type of way as I, I was really trying my best to be on top of the news. It's a lot. It's Discord, it's uh, Twitter, it's uh, direct communications through Signal and Telegram. It's all these conferences that are happening right now. It's really a lot. And I'm really curious to see how um, those that are in the space keep up with everything and what are the hacks around that. And thank you, Luik, and thank you, Magdalena. Nice to see you all. Um, okay, so I guess there's a bunch of things. First of all, lo lovely, lovely, lovely topic. Um, and you know, as I mentioned earlier, I do agree. I mean, blockchain is, you know, to be thought of as a political system, right? And as a social system and has the potential to append things partially because of its very transparent framework. Um, and I think the other thing that's really powerful is that whatever you drop on blockchain is there permanently or could be there permanently. And therefore, you know, a legacy is preserved effectively for eternity, which, which is, um, both scary, but also powerful if you want to leave something behind, right? Now, in, in terms of um, your question as to how to keep up with things. So I think, um, I don't know that there is an answer of let's go and go to every conference and talk to every person. Because I think it's a little bit like, you know, if you, if so, if we agree that blockchain is like a political system, um, and, and, and by the way, the way I think of layer one and layer two protocols like Ethereum and so on, I think of them as nations, right? They have their particular culture. They have their particular setup. They are built on a kind of consensus, right? And the economic activity, by the way, if you want to measure its size, should be viewed like a GDP from our perspective as well. So you don't view a blockchain like a, like, like a, like, like a PNL. You look at a blockchain in terms of its size of its economic activity to determine, let's say, its wealth, right? Um, and its health, shall we say, right? So, so, so that to me is how I, I look at that. Then, it's a little bit like, you know, um, for you, for instance, rather, because it's also impossible for me to keep up to breast with everything is, you know, what are the values that you most align with? Because not all blockchains and not all communities necessarily share your vision, right? And then find the communities that best align to your ideals and start from there, because I think it's easier. It's also much more digestible. I think it's probably also mentally healthier. Right. Um, and where I spend a lot of my time, frankly speaking, is not specifically just on blockchain, because I think blockchain as a system that can develop these sort of um, structures of belief in, you know, for instance, our views on capitalism and how it can reform capitalism is, is a big belief that we have with blockchain. But in order for me to get stronger at that, I, I study a lot of philosophy and sociology. I don't actually go to a blockchain conference necessarily and talk to blockchain guys about sort of you know smart contract deployments. I mean that's helpful too sometimes, but I I I, I go reread you know Locke and Adam Smith and I study study things around 
you know, basically, um, you know, um, even Marx, you know, I, you don't have to agree with it, but you have to understand it and to implement in terms of the incentive systems or the blockchain systems or the token systems around why it makes sense and what the thinking behind is, you know, because, you know, we concern ourselves with things like, how do you distribute more equity? How do we make it more fair? You know, what is, what would be considered justice, right? Um, in a system like this, right? So that doesn't, that's not blockchain, actually. I mean, it is blockchain as a technology could do this, but it is, you know, philosophy. And, um, and that is something that you need to have um, your own inclination. It might be good to know the counterparts, but each of us have, uh, you know, it's like some people are ultra libertarian, right? Some people are more socialist, more simple or whatever. And if that's the inclination, you know, then then you can build from that and grow from that. So that's at least that's how I think of it. And, and that's, you know, I never thought of, for instance, going to every conference and trying to consume all knowledge. I don't think I can do that. Uh, I think I, I think it would go, go crazy if I actually did. Thank you. So, Nicola, please uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um... Hi everyone, and uh, hi at uh, nice to meet you. Thank you for sharing. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, as uh, I'm running a Web3 game studio, uh, everything you said it resonated a, a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, my question is about the metaverse. Um, what do you think about um, uh, the Facebook move to rename uh, the company Meta? Uh, do you think it's a good thing? And um, what is your ideal vision of a metaverse to succeed, basically? Well, so first, you know, um, to talk about Facebook's metaverse. First of all, I think we need to give credit to uh, Mark Zuckerberg because he I, he knows what's up. I think I'm, we should also remember that for you know he was one of the first major groups that was trying to do a cryptocurrency. So he had a fascination of blockchain, like with Libra, way, way before many of the other companies in the space even thought about it, right? But of course, you know, because of Facebook's history and so on, you know, they weren't able to do it. Some of the best new protocol designs have come out of Facebook engineers who were building in the blockchain team who had all left because Facebook was hamstrung. Um, so, so, so I think he understands this, which means he does understand the decentralized culture and he understands where it's going and which is what we think is going to happen, which is you know, companies like Facebook are going to be absolutely sort of threatened by this because this entire business model is based basically on sort of owning our data. And so if you decentralize that ownership, then what happens, right? And it's a little bit sort of this is parallel of, well, you're the king and now you give up your kingdom. How many people willingly do this, right? You know, even if it's arguably better for the health of the community, you know, very few people want to do that because it's also a lot about power. So the consequence is that by renaming themselves Meta, you reframe the conversation. It's possibly the threat. You know, when you're having a dinner conversation, oh, you're, you're in the metaverse? Isn't that Facebook? Because they're called Meta, right? So I think from a PR standpoint, I think it was a, like, a, like, a, like a genius idea, but people do have living memories. And you know, if Facebook did this 10 years ago, maybe it'd be okay. But because of so many things that Facebook has done in the past that's been, you know, subverting democratic systems, you know, you know, censoring news, you know, whatever it is that they've done inadvertently or intentionally, um, they've become bad actors. So nobody trusts them to do this. So everyone looks at them with suspicion as a result. So I think they will have a very, very steep um, uphill battle to deal with. And I would say one thing to me, what's most powerful about um, the, the open metaverse is this idea Right. So the idea of a decentralized, open, democratic digital society is very, very powerful. And I view it very similar to how, you know, as, a, as an overseas Chinese, you know, I looked at America in the 70s and 80s as that beacon of, you know, opportunity. Actually, when I moved to America in the early 90s, it was terrible. It was height of the recession. I was actually broken in twice. I saw huge inequity, people really desperately poor, right? But in Europe, when I grew up, you know, I, I, you know, for those of you who remember this, I'm probably showing my age, but you know, the American hero in the in the Germanic speaking region was David Hasselhoff, as we watched Knight Rider and Baywatch, and so that was my American image, and it was about, you know, like you know, freedom and democracy and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, so going to America was disillusioning, but the idea 
of a democratic system. And the idea of uh, sort of capitalist opportunities never left. And that's actually the most powerful thing. So the rest of the world that was trying to control its ideas of its particular way of government couldn't fight the imagination of people saying, but we want freedom or we want democracy. And that I think is what the open metaverse represents, which is, you know, it's esoteric, right? It's like, I can't really touch it and feel it, but I know I want digital freedom. I know I need to have data ownership. I, it's better. I don't want to be controlled by Facebook, right? How we get there is obviously part of the journey, but we don't actually know the answer as we also don't fully know the answer of any society, what a real city strong democracy looks like, but you don't give that up anymore because once that idea sits in your head, you can't lose it. Um, and, and I think this is why Facebook won't succeed unless it opens up itself. And I think the fact that they started accepting NFTs in Instagram and in Facebook to me is a sort of tacit acknowledgement that they've already accepted that open is coming and we need to somehow play. So that's at least my perspective. Yet, I want to be respectful of your time. It, uh, it's been an hour. We're going. We have three questions to go. How are you doing with time? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. You're good. Amazing. What time is it in Hong Kong? It's 1, it's 1 a.m., so it's fine. <laughs> I don't have any meetings after this. <laughs> <laughs> You're a warrior. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I was thinking just as a break, I was thinking, I was talking to my friends in the Amazon forest yesterday on, on WhatsApp. And I was thinking, you know, they have this notion that they call Page, you know, the masters there, right? And uh, I was thinking, listening to you, you're definitely a page of uh, of this world and of uh, of the crypto. And it's really interesting. Like this is why I'm so fascinating with the two worlds coming together because it's just too. Like uh, we were talking to a friend yesterday who was saying, it's a cool idea to mix the two because uh, the ultimate human beings will be the one that have you know the the power of consciousness. Let's call it this way, or the forest, whatever it is, monks. And the one from this world and can go from one to another. Anyway, uh, Prima, you are in a jungle in Hawaii. This is why you don't have video. I love it. So from the jungle, <laughs> do you have a question from y for Yad? Thank you, Loic. Uh, I met you about a decade ago, been following your journey and a very big fan of Yatsu and Animoco. Uh, probably the, you know, follow everything you guys do. We're in the mental health space and really trying to bring transparency to plant medicine and uh, trying to unite people through figuring out how to bring the metaverse into psychedelic journeys. And we went ahead and bought an estate next to Axie Infinity in the sandbox and have really had a hard time finding a development team that you know resonates with our vision. Uh, we have been in the tech space for a long time and uh, would love you. Would love if you could point us in the right direction. Great. Well, it's a it's a wonderful mission. So first of all, um, you know, there's a series of uh, Web three metaverse builders on Sandbox. You know, uh, whether it's Pangu or Index Games or whatever, that would be we're probably happy to build the experiences. Finding someone though that resonates with what you're doing is probably a, a reflection of the market size right now, right? Which is that you probably, you know, as it becomes more mainstream, you'll end up finding developers that have maybe empathy to, you know, your cause. But for the time being, I would say that it's hard to do that because we're still only talking about a single digit percentage of global adoption, relatively speaking, in the meta in the open metaverse. So, so um, here, I think you need to spend more time saying what you want to build and do, because as you know, you can probably um, re sort of realize that you know, um, mental health is also not a, you know, common topic in many places. People don't talk about it openly. People are, in some, some societies, discussion of mental health is, is not considered, like with children, right? You know, it might be, you know, learning differences are actually disorders in some places, right? So, so, so these are things that, um, that need active education. So you have a higher uh, sort of mountain to climb, but I think it's important, um, you know, what you do. So, uh, so, so, so in that sense, you know, we can give you, you know, I, I can give some recommendations of three or four groups that I know that can build the stuff for you, uh, whether they can, whether they're the right team for you, I don't know, right? But obviously that's, that's uh, easy to introduce uh, builders um, in, in that sense. Um, but the other thing I would say is that, you know, building a sandbox isn't that complicated. 
you know, if you use the game maker and the voxel builder, actually, you don't need programming skills to do it. Um, so, so one other opportunity would be, you know, is there a group of, you know, people in your space that might look at that opportunity? And one thing is, is you could go through the grant mechanism. You could go to the sandbox creators grant or the accelerator, and you could say, you know, we're trying to build a mental health platform on sandbox, and this is the benefit for it. And we'd like to ask for a grant. That gives it prominence, right? And we've given over, you know, we've given millions of dollars in, in grant funding for for companies um, that do interesting things. So, so that's something you can try to avail yourself as well too. It's an independent foundation that grants it, but we have given them the funds to do so. Yet, before we take Ricard, um, I should have started with this, but you're kind of one of our very first guests. Before that, we were only this group. Um, I should have asked you, what do you have any either consciousness, spiritual practice, meditation that you can share with us? Uh, that should be my first question, really, or any your participation in retreats, or, well, we also talk about, you know, plant medicine and psychedelics, feel free to not answer that question if you don't want, because we're all in public right now. But I'm just curious, actually, I've never asked you that question. Well, so I don't actually deal in psychedelics. <laughs> so, and that has nothing to do with, I know a lot of friends who have, right? Um, for those who grew up in Austria, they know that even though it wasn't technically illegal, it was a pretty liberal place <laughs> for this type of stuff in the 80s. Um, but uh, it was just not, and I would say the main reason why I never dealt in this stuff is really because uh, for me, it was just really like like the the mental faculties for me were just really, really important that I felt I had to sort of have consciousness around that, shall we say. But what I do in terms of, you know, so first of all, I would say for me, um, I hike a lot, right? To me, hiking is actually very, I don't know if you want to call it meditative because I don't think of it as meditation in the same sense. But um, when I really go through really intensive hike um, and exert myself physically quite strongly, um, then actually what happens, particularly if I'm in a, in a cool place, you know, things heighten. So I start to sort of um, be more alert and um, I guess a certain kind of consciousness develops for me. And I like this feeling, right? Uh, and the clarity comes. And so for me, hiking is a way to have clarity, being in the mountains is a way to do it. And I do this as a family as well. But you know, when we hike, we don't necessarily talk, right? We, we just walk, right? Um, but then but then at the end, just uh, sort of the aspect of doing this together is a, a kind of spiritual uh, sort of, um, a kind of spiritual connecting. I'm, I'm not religious, but I do have, um, I, you know, I take comfort in that. So, so um, I have done meditation, um, you know, with groups before and with, you know, masters. And I can't say that it has, that I've, I've, I've um, that it's worked for me in the sense that I have gone through it, but I, it hasn't, you know, I haven't, I haven't, um, you know, I haven't reached that plane where I can sort of, sort of, uh, sort of experience it at, at the level that others can. And I have done hikes, yeah. I've done hikes with you in Hong Kong, first off, they're beautiful, which yes. I did not expect because I have this view of that everybody has of Hong Kong of a skyline. But there are so beautiful hikes, and we did talk a lot. But yeah, that's that's also kind of what I have in mind is to mix people who there are some people here who don't care about business, by the way. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> and, yeah. and some people who don't care about you know, so it's like mixing, which I find interesting. Anyway, and, uh, yes, go maybe ahead. Maybe just to think about this. Um, I, I do believe, for instance, that um, you know, I think people are driven, ideally, people are driven by an impact and purpose that they feel that they can fulfill, for, you know, uh, for themselves. It's that sort of um, purpose that I think drives people. And I feel, you know, for me, I feel like I have a purpose um, in what I'm building. So that's actually the what, what's your purpose yet? What's your what's your purpose as in Yatsu? What is your life purpose? If you if you said I think I have a purpose, that's that's actually a very interesting one. Well, I mean, first of all, my life purpose evolves, right? In the sense that if you had asked me the question 20 years ago, it would have been a very different answer because I was a different person and I had different experiences. But today, I definitely view my life purpose to deliver digital property rights um, as a mission. And I, to me, this feels something important to me. And it's the reason why I feel I have a lot of energy in this space. I'm happy to talk about it and I'm happy to discuss it. Because I think it's it's valuable, not necessarily not just to me, but to everything, to everyone I do. And I, I offer this too. And 
I think that the collective personal experiences of how I grew up, like if the fact that I grew up in Europe and had these experiences has led me to think about the world this way. But I didn't know that, you know, um, and I would say I didn't even know that 10 years ago, that this would, you know, that, you know, this moment might lead me to this, for instance, and building a business that might actually, like from my, our perspective, maybe potentially even reform or reinvent capitalism as a, you know, as a net positive force, as opposed to right now, particularly in the West, where capitalism is viewed, you know, in many cases as a negative force, as a, as, as, as something that drives a form of serfdom and a form of feudalism in a different way, right? Which I disagree with, but I understand what ha what happened. And so, so, so there are drivers around that I think is possible. But again, it it's um, it needed, you know, the the fifty years or so of the past to 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 uh, to gestate to this point where I feel I can do this. Because you know, I wouldn't be able, I wouldn't have been able to do this maybe even ten years ago, right? No, no. Animoca Brands is a huge company, and and uh, so what, what is when I pass it to Ricard? The, what is like in say twenty years? Why not? Right? Because you've been <laughs> running this anim. When I knew you, you were already running Animoca, so you're not the kind of guy that sells or like you know you just so focused on your own. So you're right. Now you have huge means and huge, you know, impact if you want to. What is Animal Kind 10, 20 years? Like, let's even push it more yet. Like, <clears throat> sorry, feel free to not answer. When you <laughs> die, when you die, what do you yeah. think will make you, of course, your family and friends, but like that you have accomplished with Animal Car or in general, that you think is going to be like, yeah, I died, but wow, right? I did that too. Long. <laughs> well, okay, so I, I don't, I don't think of it quite this way. I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm too happy living life to think about what it's like to die. However, if I was to think of the impact that I want to um, leave, you know, it's definitely um, shaping the way people think about, you know, basically their rights online and how it can improve their life. Like for me, the satisfaction would be that we have decentralized power across you know, people who spend all their time online anyway, which is most of us today. And the fact that we have actual digital property, because I view the effects of digital property to be the same like physical property, right? If you look at physical property in the real world, the kind of countries and economies that have strong property rights, you know, they have good GDPs and broadly a more distributed wealth class and therefore also functioning democracies and the kind of countries that don't have property rights, like say North Korea on the extreme side or very shaky property rights, they have low GDPs and typically despotic countries and run in a certain kind of way that you know we all would accept is not is not healthy. Right. So so I think that would be sort of the 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 target and the goal. And that would be the legacy um, and what we want to be remembered by. And and honestly, I think it evolves too, right? Um, as as we study more on the philosophical aspects and as we look at DAOs and you know, it's a it's a learning process, right? It's it's not it's not a final form. It may never be a final form, um, but if we can in, and and what I find inspiring about Web three, especially right now, is the young builders in the space are coming at it with a kind of optimism about building a better future. That frankly, a lot of older people lose when they get cynical about the world, right? And I think this is part of the of the of the gap, which is, you know, younger people look at Web three and say. This is the hope. This is what we can do here. And older people are like, you can't change the world. This is how it is. You know, this is how it will always be. And therefore, don't bother. And and they become cynical about about this stuff, right? So so I think this is something that um, that uh, you know we can help foster more. Thank you. Yet I would have a hundred more questions, but Ricard, everyone. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's really, really good to be in this conversation. I think like Web3 has influenced my life the last, yeah, I guess my entire life and especially the last 10 years. Uh, and since most of my work has been about the Internet of Things. And I guess like and having a view that all of us are living in the past, like it takes 40 to 400 to 600 milliseconds to compute the reality, which means there is a gap where we can be manipulated. So Web3 plays quite a critical role in the ownership of our own experience or reality, I guess. So there is a couple of questions that I'm curious about where they are in your mind. And one of them is proof of work. Uh, how will the future proof of work look like? Because I, I guess like 
we need some way to secure the chain or whatever we are using. And uh, related to that is also like, when do will we fully go like peer to peer mesh with our chains? Uh, today, it's still somehow centralized, uh, even though it's possible to decentralize, not that many people can run their own chain, I guess. And uh, that also, I want to tie that into quantum computing what happens to the web three when quantum computing really becomes reality. And I guess quantum computing is already reality some, at some places that in the world, which means that security and encryption is also probably compromised. Uh, so those questions I had like about web three, and I'm also curious about like this biohacking, like manipulating ourselves and the reality that I experience is something that is really deeply into my heart. And for us that have been playing around with biohacking are for the most familiar with neurofeedback. And neurofeedback, for those who don't, do not know, is a very easy way to manipulate how the brain operates. And being like using it, I guess I, I've been doing work with uh, uh, virtual reality, mixed reality as a tool for neurofeedback. And uh, being stuck inside of a virtual reality is a pretty extensive way of uh, yeah manipulating our brain and brainwashing us. So that was two categories of question. One like more in Web three and <laughs> how you look into like neurofeedback and what okay. the I guess like the scary side of the beautiful things that we can create with metaverse can do to us. All right. So obviously very theoretical questions, but. No, uh, great to discuss them. So first of all, um, in terms of proof of work or, you know, the, uh, for instance, what's happening with Ethereum and, and, and many other protocols already moving to proof of stake, right? Outside of the fact that it is obviously and more energy efficient and more environmentally friendly, one of the other benefits of proof of stake is that the delegation, right? And the voting and the control of the consensus is distributed across a large number of holders rather than the ones that have the most you know, work capacity, which in this case means compute power, right? And if you think of the proof of work concept in the physical sense, it's you could you could it's basically labor, right? And so in the classic sense, you know, if you labor for it, then you ought to, you know, that that is your reward, that is your 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 taking, so to speak. And therefore, you know, you uphold the security uh, or the the validity of your community, your network through that effort. And proof of stake is basically a version of that, except just to ownership and. And so the key thing is how do you build a consensus that is distributed enough so that it's not centralized in power, right? And that's all about building communities in the right way. So for instance, when you look at, you know, um, the way that you can earn the tokens as opposed to buying the tokens, right? So the number of our projects were, you know, through an act of labor um, into the community, you earn tokens. So it's a different kind of proof of work. It's not necessarily the proof of work that comes from mining, but it comes from the proof of work yeah. of, of a contributing activity um, that is, you know, then also driven by consensus of the community, you then are, are able to distribute the value. Those who add more value to the community should receive more tokens, right? How do you do that? And that could be, and that's where, for instance, blockchain games are interesting because, you know, you can gamify it through an effort where this, this comes with an actual output. Because one of the things that, like in even with traditional Web 1, Web 2 games, actually they are new systems. Every time you play a game, you're learning a tutorial of a new system. You actually creating a new ecosystem, you're being taught about a new a new value construct, right? Just think about, you know, how we all are comfortable, not all, but the gamers, which is like two thirds of the internet, are comfortable with first person shooters. Like, you know what, like, you know, or comfortable with the way that they use a mouse or a keyboard or whatever, you know, why is WASD, you know, the controls movement, right? I mean, those are all new habits that were formed through a new education that happened through gaming as an example, right? And spawn industries like you know razor with keyboards and mice and whatever. So, so I guess well, gaming has that potential to just really sort of sort of demonstrate other kinds of work, which is why blockchain and gaming fit very nicely into it. So I think there is there is something there around around that because because even in the gaming community, you're adding value to that ecosystem by playing in the game, and therefore you know which like play and earn can provide you should get a share of that value. And then that share of the value might give you a voting right, which you can then stake. You have a proof of stake, right? And 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 imagine what, say, a future Facebook might look like, 
or every user of Facebook actually had a vote in where it would go, as opposed to the shareholders. Right? The formation of that social network would be very different. It's it's uh, it's it's setup would look different. Um, maybe it wouldn't be doing the things that it's doing, um, and would be more sustainable. We think anyway. Now, um, <laughs> in terms of the in terms of your consciousness, so I mean, you know, uh, this becomes quite quite philosophical because there's big questions around whether you know how how we how we identify our reality, and in some ways, the reality of what we see is maybe different than what others see. Um, one thing that is interesting around blockchain, though, if you do something on chain, is that it still has to be based on a majority consensus. So your reality is what other people's reality are as well. It's a bit different because if you build something on chain, if, if you're the only one that thinks it's this way and everyone else doesn't agree, then it's not reality, at least on chain. So, so there is this element where the community holds it together um, in, a, in a protocol level which if you think about it in the way actual communities are constructed is probably true too. Like we have to have a common value system. If we all have <laughs> very random value systems, we're probably not one culture and we're not one society anyway. And so we're breaking up. And which by the way, you see in countries or societies that have disagreements about their cultures and then they splinter off or they want to splinter off and then maybe wars happen or it's how revolutions happen because we disagree on stuff like this. Um, it comes from, you know, Maybe maybe stronger ideologies, but but as a construct is like this too. So and in blockchain it happens as well, where you know you see many cases where where chains fork off, right? So you could actually look at the forking of a chain as essentially the the forking off of a community consciousness into a different into a different group that has a different belief or a different system of values, um, and then exist there. And that's fine too. Maybe they're a micro community, but that's what they want, and they can exist in such a way. So, so uh, I think I think it's you know something that blockchain can amplify, but of course I don't think it, people are thinking about it quite this way at least yet. <laughs> Guys, I want to be uh, respectful of Yat's time. It's uh, we have six minutes to go. Um, as these calls are always one hour and thirty, if, if it's your first. Um, Mikhail and, and Julien, would you mind asking your questions like really quick so we can have both of you and maybe uh, just a little closing thoughts from Yat. Thank you. So, Mihai, you want to go? Hi. Hey, Loic. <laughs> Good to see you, Magdalena. Nice to meet you. And uh, uh, yeah, it's been many years. Uh, I remember. Since... Yes. Yes. It's me too. <laughs> it was great. Um, so, first of all, uh, a couple of words, mindful of everybody's time. I think uh, what Loic and Magdalena, you're doing, it's quite phenomenal with uh, power because... As we discussed earlier, I think Web3, it's all about sovereignty, ownership, community, and putting the individual back at the center of the society. Uh, something that we've been deprived for, I mean, since forever, really. Uh, of course, Web2, but think about our governance and how governments until now have uh, utilized their power to kind of allow, you know, force us to surrender everything we had to a, a dominant force. And I think blockchain allows everyone to be again in control of what they do to own their value, to, to, to literally hold the keys to their destiny. And NFTs and communities are here for that. And the fascinating thing about DAOs is that we're rethinking again how human beings can reorganize themselves probably for the first time in, in since forever, really, <laughs> uh, through technology. And, and what I found fascinating with Pawa is that we can combine what's technically possible today and never have been before with ancient wisdom and ancient thoughts that we as species, we used to know, but kind of forgot it because we we plunged into this very materialistic world right so that, that that's kind of to segue into into the question but to say how fascinated i am to see me hi thank you so much we need to have a separate call about this because uh <laughs> you seem to know better than i do where we're going so please uh, <laughs> so my, my, yes. my question to yet and, and no, no, no no but yes i agree it's fascinating <laughs> and uh and we'll have a lot of fun which is also very important you know 
or that well that that's all about that both things yeah i i cannot wait to have you on stage with an indigenous with feathers and have both of you exchange point of views on society because you know they also have very very clear ways of seeing things they think we're all sick completely sick you know they're like and by the way they don't want to fix us per se so at least was i work with but they're but like, you guys like you you've lost it just come come here spend time with animals in the forest get your phone away Right, so it's fascinating. I cannot wait to do to make this happen. Anyway, Mihai, your question because we have four minutes. Yes. Left. So, so, so my my question, yeah, it's quite straightforward. Uh, we, we know how transformational Web three will be for societies, for economies, for individuals. Uh, so, therefore, the question is, uh, how can we accelerate and maximize uh, onboarding of the next billion people? On Web three, how do we make that uh, easier yeah. and simpler? You know, we we launched a, a, an entertainment platform, in, you know, a Web three video platform called Beam. Uh, that's that's purely Web three, and we think entertainment is one of the ways, right, to to bring people, as Animoca does with with games. But the real question is, you know, <laughs> if you need to have a wallet and MetaMask, yeah, that's great. But most people just to watch videos or interact with NFTs, they're not ready for that yet. Yeah. How let, do you see that? Behind, because we're going to run to 7.30. Let, let, so yeah. how do we get it to a billion people? That's a question. Thank you, Mihai. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So so um, first of all, um, one of the reasons we focused on gaming is because we think that's the way we'll get to the billions of users quickly, because gamers have a relationship with their virtual goods as one of ownership. You just ask your children what they want for Christmas. Um, or you or what they want for their birthday and it's likely going to be something digital as opposed to something physical in the past so they have already that intrinsic relationship with it and for them it's natural and most importantly the community around them all their friends when they buy a virtual good in the game they accept that that is ownership they don't think of it as rental right and therefore it's very clear to them so so if i would i would say that uh, that's how we, we onboarded because it's like the, the relatively soft underbelly of that sector. But there is a distinction because in the West, particularly in America, a lot of gamers don't like an NFTs because of the capitalism and the financification in there. They worry about it because of the real life effects it has had in their own life. Whereas in Asia, for instance, people view it very positively. Um, so there is a, a different thing. We don't have time to go into this right now, but. But there is an element there that, that does create a little bit of a bifurcation currently in the market. Um, but, but the other thing that we're excited about sort of decentralization to your earlier point is that's how you know, we can teach people about actual values of a democratic system. Because when do you actually practice democracy in your life? <laughs> you build consensus amongst your friends, but you don't actually think of it as a democratic framework. You don't have to work with strangers to, to develop a common idea. We do this in games a little bit when you work in a guild and so on. So it's a form of that. But actually, when you think of it as a DAO and it becomes commonplace across all of our communities, you're basically introducing democratic values and democratic systems right from ground zero. And to me, that's what's powerful. Because right now we 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 sometimes think democracy only happens every four years, right? Somehow, right? Even though it's Im embedded in our way of life, we take it for granted. Sure. Uh, all right, we, we, we need to. Julien, can you you think you can do it in one sentence? Uh, I will try to be very fast. Yes, uh, hello everybody. Uh, I'm in the digital science field, uh, and I wonder just two two fast question and it could be the in one answer uh, about uh, using Web three. Just, just, just uh, one, Julien. Just sorry, just one question because we are supposed to stop now. Yeah, uh, for to, to go back to power, uh, for for instance, for ancient knowledge, for indigenous people uh, that uh, have some knowledge uh, about medicinal uh, traditional medicines and use uh, when we can get from some molecules or some psychotrop. And do you think that uh, Web3 can be a solution to uh, make them uh, be uh, keep their ownership, get some uh, rewards by tokenization because they don't have sometimes access to bank uh, uh, infrastructure and keep the something fair 
uh, equity. And uh, because in science, it's not always easy to, to integrate technology and different actors, public actors with public fundings and uh, private companies. Because I have some example in Brazil where Julia, startups... yeah, we got the question. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, so, I'm a so, bad guy so now. Short, yeah, so, so, so the short answer is there is ways to do this, I think. Um, you know, legal constructs aside, at least the validation of the blockchain allows, for instance, transactions to take place where value can go into someone's wallet. And that wallet could be anywhere in the world. It could be in the, it could be owned by a person in the Amazon forest. It could be somewhere, you know, all over the place, right? So, so the, the benefit of this is that you no longer, you don't need a bank account. In fact, um, you don't need permission for a bank account. You don't need to be part of a financial sort of uh, allow list, shall we say. Rather, you need a device, any device, and you set up a wallet and you can receive. And if, if someone helps you mint the smart contract and this wallet will receive royalties from the sale of these you know, um, ideas or the sale of these assets or art or whatever, or the royalties related to that, it will come from that. You can, you can even make it in such a way where it automatically only goes to that wallet, depending what the product is and how it's, how it's coded. And that could become a constant stream of course, whoever owns a wallet then has the say power, shall we say. But but in that sense, um, you know, you could do that. And that's the great thing. Like in places like Africa, for instance, this is where you can, you know, uh, people who are unbanked because they can't do business because they only make $1 or $2. Well, blockchain is fine. It doesn't matter if you make 10 cents. You can transact on that uh, on certain kind of blockchains as well. So so I would, I would say generally, yes. Yet it's 113 Hong Kong. I bet your first call it's at 7 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs> so we need to we need to let you go. But thank you so much, Yat. I uh, I I hope you can you join us in, in person in Paris or you'll be on Zoom. Uh, it'd be a pleasure. When is it? Fourteenth uh, and fifteenth of October. I see. I'll, like, I'll, I'll have get a look. Back to you. I'll get back to you. <laughs> well, we yeah. we would like to have you on Zoom in any case for sure. Right. But thank you so much for this. Thank you everybody for being present here. And uh, yet I, I would have, we will all keep going for four or five hours here. So hopefully we keep, keep the conversation in, uh, in another way, but I'm very, very grateful for your presence here and I wish you a good night. I let you go. Thank you everybody. Thank you yet. Talk soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yad. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. <laughs> There is some stuff in the chat, yeah. Because when I close Bye Zoom, everyone. yeah, when I close Zoom, we lose everything in the chat. So anyway, thank you everyone for joining. Next Tuesday, same thing, 6 p.m. Paris time. And then, if you are not on Discord, please uh, email me loikdirect at gmail.com. I'll get you on the Discord community as well. Thank you. Bye bye.